thank you all for joining me to this chat for this chat uh, for the lives of Luck Lamora, my favorite series of all time. Yeah. Any okay. What you got? Yay, we have three different editions. Um, this is my favorite series. Everybody here at the very least enjoys this book. So we're going to have a chat about the story. All of us have videos already discussing the book on our individual channels. Each will be linked in the description of this video. Um, but since we all already have videos, I'm just going to let this be a free form conversation. We're just friends hanging out talking about a book that we love. So Starting with you, Grace, how do you find The Lies of Locke Lamora? Well, one thing I'll just mention quickly first is that I don't think I have a dedicated video because I read this in 2020 before I had a channel. Okay. So um, it might just have to be my channel in general that's linked, but I can say that I do love the book. Um, it's been five stars on both reads for me, and this was like one of my first booktube inspired reads from you murphy ah! um, and that like you were the first person that i heard about it from and like it was one of those um like kind of buzzwords for me where i really love like a heist story like back in maybe like 2016 or 17 i read like six of crows and stuff and i thought this kind of sounds like the adult fantasy yes. version kind of of that sounds really up my alley and it just turned out to be like exactly what I like in terms of like having the plot and the characters kind of working together where like yeah. it moves pretty quickly but you get a real sense of the characters they're so like colorful and they really have like their personalities especially Locke and the kind of like world building and everything is just um everything is just enough I think in this book to just like work together perfectly I don't want to go on for too long because obviously no, you're great keep talking but um that's kind of my like brief synopsis reasons for loving it yeah I love that that's very I, I love that for you it feels like everything is just enough and not too much because a lot of people find this book a little bit verbose or the pacing to be too slow like it it feels almost like a plot especially at the beginning did you not experience any of that I I'm one of the people that just like loves the flashbacks and loves all of that. Like I know that that's kind of a popular maybe like complaint if you don't like the book as much is like sure. confusion or like you said, like pacing. But um, that was one of those things where when people started saying it, I was absolutely baffled because yeah. I just I had no issues with any of it. I loved it so much. Like I like I'm someone who really likes a split timeline and like a multi POV. So I I didn't have any, like it was totally smooth sailing for me. Good. What, now, Ben, you you had kind of mixed feelings on it at first, positive, but some pros and pro some cons. What was your experience with the book the first time? Uh, the, the first time I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I ended up giving it, like I, I did give it a four star originally. Um, and the only complaints I had was like summer around the midpoint some of the flashbacks i know it's like a, it's a very common complaint but it's the fact that like something would happen in the flashback to directly like implement or solve a problem or like be directly involved the next chapter and sometimes i felt like that could have been foreshadowed earlier rather than oh. the before. but i think on reread it's kind of like yeah that, that's technically a thing but it's like it wouldn't work anywhere else and it kind of works on, on I, I don't know on a reread it definitely worked for me where um like nothing felt contrived like it did a little bit that first time I, I think everything flowed better for me and like I, I know in terms of pacing I had no problems with the pacing the first time because I really enjoy uh, I assume is this all, all spoilers yeah this um, is all spoilers yeah. I'll have it in the it's, title that it's spoilers <clears throat> I really like the uh, the part where um, when uh, after the kind of the 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 general fall of everything and um, and and a lot of the gang is just gone and I really like when it, it just slows down and it's like rather than the, the book could have very easily ramped to a crescendo and ended and instead yeah. it's like okay well now we need to go to nothing and we need to set up all the moving pieces again and that that was the part that i think i appreciated a lot more the second time round where i was like that takes a lot of nerve to be like the pacing no i'm not i'm not speeding up if anything we're going to slow down for a while and yeah. uh, i think that's a uh, I, I love that on reread 
Yeah. I think writing style, pacing, storytelling, formula, um, even like three-act structure, all the things that are commonplace and accepted and correct, Lynch, is he does his own, like he forges his own path. And sometimes that can feel a little bit, I, per, for me, actually, the last little chunk, what you just described, where it feels like we've just hit the climax, now it's time for a falling action and then wrap it up. And he's like, let's start a new story, kind of, right? Or a whole new arc. For me, I think that that part could be tightened up a little bit. But at the same time, I just love that at around any corner, you never really know what the story is going to do next because it's not following any kind of formula that isn't unique to this story. I kind of feel like he's like Abercrombie in that sense. I don't know if anybody else feels that way, but yeah. they're both authors who are kind of like, well, the story is what the story is. It yeah. might be going in a pacing or direction that you expect it to be at all, but this is what's yeah. going to happen right now. Yes. Yes, I completely agree. And I think anytime an author just really takes risks and does something really different, I automatically appreciate it more when you read so much. It's like, ah, oh, something really innovative makes it so exciting. Bryce, how did you find the book? Oh, man. Um, this was just coming off of I had just like consumed A Song of Ice and Fire and came to the real realization um, that the Feast for Crows was not, in fact, the last book. Uh, and was going online and trying to figure it out. And uh, and then it, it was essentially, Lies of Locke Lamora would be listed amongst Malazan or Malazan, however you want to call it, uh, A Song of Ice and Fire, all these big, huge, um, you know, Dragon Riders of Pern even, and, and just all the big ones. So I was like, all right, well, I got to check this out. And I, you know, and, and Sanderson was there too, but it was like, uh, you know, I was looking for gritty, you know, the grim, grimmer stuff. Uh, like I just experienced with the Song of Ice and Fire. So I picked that one up pretty quickly after uh, uh, Lies. And, and it was just, it blew my mind with just how much fun it would be. Like I, I'm a sucker for a con uh, for an Ocean's Eleven or whatever you name it. Uh, just, you know, just a clever, and this was just so clever from from page one. Um, and I could say, you know, it definitely was on reread that I appreciated the flashbacks so much more. Uh, one of the big things for me was, since we're into spoiler, <laughs> was, you know, a lot of times the flashbacks would set up something for the next, like, present day moment, right? And you'd learn, you know, kind of learn something, and then he, like, utilizes it. But one of my favorites was just a total throw-off, where it's that last, like, climactic, I guess, incident where... Locke's like holding out for Jean and then uh, he doesn't actually ever come even though that was set up like way earlier as like you know Jean comes right he's just like, he shows up long you just have to wait for Jean and he like he used it as like a trick like it was like that is just like not only tricking the like bad guy but but to trick us as a reader, I was just like, this yeah. is genius. It was like such a, like, cause that's what I was used to. He set me up with like, all right, like I learned something and then it pays off. And then I learned something and then it pays off in the future. Yeah. And then to just have this like, oh my gosh, that was so brilliant. Like, I just thought, I don't know. It just got me so well. Uh, the, the, the pros I think just matches they're these are you know they're con men but they're actors right like what else yeah. is acting but uh you know putting on a lie right or whatever you know it, and just to to so i just thought it just matched so well uh i i'm a little um i guess uh, blinded i guess by the reread i just did because i was just in love from like page one to the last page and i i didn't see like i just had so much fun i think just being back in with like my friends right uh with <laughs> with my good friends and just enjoying a good caper i mean even just down to like i never appreciated bug in the first one yeah but to to, to appreciate Bug in this one where he is, I mean, even just some of the ways that uh, he's described in this one, uh, I don't know, it just, it had me just cracking up left and right. Some of the, anyway, just, just so many things just did it so well for me. It was brilliant. Yeah. I love it. What was that, that introduction line for Bug when he was like, he was standing at the top of the structure and he, and he, he put his arms out and he fell into the, the pile of trash. I think it was. And he's like, with all the confidence of a 12 year old who believes yes. that everything bad in the in the world happens to everyone not named Bug or something <laughs> like that. 
<laughs> it's like, what a brilliant, that's something that I love about this book is the, he, Lynch is so good about completely describing a character in just one little thing like that. Like I know who Bug is now just based off of that thing. And same with Locke in the very beginning when it's like he steals too much. If he, if he had a neck wound and he was dying and a doctor came to sew him up, he would steal the needle and thread and die laughing. Like <laughs> I know exactly who Locke is now. <laughs> He's so good at that. There's a there's an Oscar Wilde quote that I always use and I always it, it, and it just is so applicable. It's uh, I'm not what is it? I'm not young enough to know everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, so that's bug. That's bug. That's that's right. Right. Yes, that's bug. Ben, were you about to say something? I was gonna say that I, I do think Lynch does that perfect job of like even if it's introducing a character through someone else's like how we're meant to react to them. My, mm -hmm. my favorite line in the entire book is when the Bonds mage turns up for the first time. And it's that we have that that flashback scene where it's uh, like Locke talking to um, to Chains. And Chains is like, no matter what, if you meet a Bonds mage, like that's the time. That is the time you show absolute respect. And then we cut back and it's the <laughs> nice bird, Ash. Like that line. <laughs> is the greatest line. And I don't think anyone else could pull off that line other than maybe Abercrombie, right. but I don't think anyone else could pull off that line like he does. It's so perfect. And yes, that's another oh, great man. thing about the flashbacks uh, is that those play off of each other so well in that sense too, not just in, okay, so we just learned about this thing and now we're going to pay off on it in the present timeline, which personally, I love that because it doesn't act as a plot device. It's not like the perfect solution dropped into your lap one chapter before you needed it. It's it's like providing context, like something as simple as Locke being sent off to, I think, a farm to go learn something new and Chains tells him, it's time for you to learn to fight on your own. And then we get the present day where he realizes, all right, I'm going to drown in this vat of horse piss with my mouth closed because my boys are getting free and he has to learn to fight on his own in present day. Like, I love that, that those little things that only make present day timeline more impactful. But then he also subverts it, like what you were talking about, Bryce, when we have that whole flashback with him saying, I'm going to, I just have to hold you here until Jean gets here. And then you're waiting for it in the next chapter, but it doesn't come until the very end of the book. Oh, man. And it subverts it. <laughs> <laughs> There's another thing that I noticed on this reread where, like, I guess in hindsight, it's kind of um, obvious to be thrown in. But in that same climax scene where we know that, like, We've seen the flashbacks. We know we were waiting for Jean. Um, there's also when the Grey King says, like, this isn't something that you can pretend your way out of. Just talking yeah. about something. And then uh, what does he do? He pretends <laughs> his way out of it by pretending that Jean is there behind him. That's so <laughs> true. Oh, my goodness. It's so good. And I love, too, at the end when you when you uh, have the the ship go up in flames and and it all it's, it, it's like one last twist that he even set up the offering for the twins and for for bug even through manipulation after all that he's just gone through he's not done lying and cheating to get exactly what he needs um one thing in the beginning there's a lot of when Locke is first introduced you have him stealing from the yellow jackets <laughs> <laughs> like like, immediately dude <laughs> no or or when he is tasked to uh do something and then he like ends up burning down the whole bar and making uh, this big plague you know fear happen or we see him we see from the beginning Locke being this incredibly brilliant and gifted kid but without actually thinking about how is this going to affect things on a wider scale? How is this going to cause more problems? And Chains is trying to beat into his head that sense, right? Like he's trying to, ex like, you have to think through this. This will affect the entire city. This is a bad thing. You're clever. Good job. Stick to simple thieving, boy. And we see that on such a large scale as an adult where his friends are like, we got to get out of here. This has gone south. We need to run. And Locke, because he's so brilliant, can see a clever way out. And, yes. and we see the consequences of that, eh? 
That's what I was going to say. Like, that's what I was just thinking while you were talking is I like that contrast where Chains is trying to teach him that when he's younger. And then when he's older, I feel like we kind of have this experience throughout the whole book where he has learned to think it all the way through. And it might not always work out for him, but like, obviously I had a vague recollection of everything that happened on the reread, but I just remember on the first read, always thinking like, well, he has thought it through. He has something else up his sleeve. Like, I can't wait to see what it actually is. Like, that's one of my favorite things about the con and the heist stories is like, there probably is a solution that the characters have come up with. And I don't mind if it's off page because I just love when it's then like unfolding in front of me and I didn't know what was gonna happen or what the solution was gonna be. Like, that's just so fun and so satisfying. Yeah, well, and, I completely and then agree. You Oh, sorry. No, no, I was just going to say, and, and in Bug, the, the tragic death of Bug, right? Yeah. Where Bug is so convinced of that, like, you know, he we're not, we're unbeatable. We're the gentleman bastards. Mm -hmm. And he's so convinced to the last, like his final moment and where Locke literally has to admit to him, we should have, we should have run. We should have, we shouldn't have done this right to him. And it's just bug. It's like, no, you convinced him, right? You convinced bug yeah. that you can do nothing wrong. You always have a way out. Even till his like final breaths was just, oh man, it was so powerful. And I'm just like bawling like the whole time. Yeah. We see that in the flashbacks as well, where you see that distinct shift when the twins start viewing Locke as their leader and and that loyalty and that okay what you say goes so that we see that in present time too when they all say let's run and Locke goes no i have a plan and they're like all right we'll follow you and that that devotedness is part of what makes this crew so incredible to watch but it's also what ended up being their downfall because Locke is a, he's an intermittently brilliant boy as chains puts it <laughs> So good. That's so well described. Maybe a dull sense of um, caution. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was maybe my misinterpretation going into my first read was um, like the idea that that Locke is brilliant, but this is very much like a tragedy of that character. And I think I was reading it expecting something different than what I got in the sense of uh, like when I realized what was happening I was like oh this is brilliant but I think on reread knowing the sense of like foreboding that happens throughout the book and, and everything whereas I think I went in with it with this idea of I was I was I was hooked by Locke I, I was fully duped by him where I was like oh well this is it everyone's told me that Locke's brilliant this is going to turn out perfectly and then you read it and you're like oh no this this went everything but perfectly. This uh, exactly. Yeah, and exactly. I, I think that, that's maybe the one. That's the one thing I always think of now. I'm like, if I'm recommending it to someone, I'm like, I can't oversell how brilliant Lock is because then I'm going to set up the fact that nothing can go wrong. And I, I don't. Maybe maybe I'm just too much of a bug. Maybe maybe I'm a, a little twelve <laughs> year old at heart that <laughs> can't Me believe. Too. You're a what was his name? Bertillion. His... Oh yeah, yeah. His full his full name. I don't remember what his full name was. He says it at the very or Locke says it at the very end. I don't remember it now. The last name. It's like Bertillion or something though. Yeah. I don't blame him for going by Bug. Bug. <laughs> bug. Yeah. Same for Locke. What's his real name? Jean said, I don't blame you for going by Locke. Whoops. Sorry. Chicken everything. <laughs> You know, um, I was thinking of at the end of this read was um, it says that he says five syllables, and I'm like. Is his full name five syllables or is his first name five syllables? Right. Because five syllables for a first name is a really long name. <laughs> so how, how much have y'all read? This is only spoilers for book one. Okay. I because I heard that the third one ends on a cliffhanger and so I've been afraid to. Me too. That. Yeah. I've, I've taken my time. <laughs> with these. Yeah. I've only read the first. Okay, okay, okay. Well, it's only spoilers for first, regardless. I actually, I don't remember the third book hardly at all, because I've only read it once. And I read it, you know, I read them relatively close together years ago. Um, but I will be rereading it soon. But anyway, I don't, there's some sort of reveal that happens in book three that I only vaguely remember. But regardless, I'm, I'm prefacing all this so that somebody 
won't yell at me if I'm saying something totally wrong because <laughs> I don't remember book three very well. Regardless, my first thought is royalty. You, that you know the long drawn out names that royals are often given and uh, Jean's response of Ugh, no wonder you go by law because of who they are knowing what he comes from it's like not nah, you're one of us like forget that name kind of response I don't know if, I mean I don't know but that's the first thing that popped into my head or even like even if you're not that and someone gave you that name this is what everyone would think of when they heard that name mm -hmm. so. yes yes very true I love the reveal to um with the magic well first of all I love that this book is set in a magical world. It's very alchemist type world. And we follow people who are trying to navigate this brutal alchemical world having none of that. We actually get to follow a normie, which you just don't get that much in fantasy. And it's just Locke being really, uh, it's his ingenuity that keeps him and his friends alive. Um, but anyway, I love that... Uh, <laughs> the reveal when uh, the falconer was it when he, when he's like Lamora is a fake name but Locke I have part of your no it was the Great King I don't know why I thought it was falconer uh, I know Ooh. that name no it was the falconer was I, it the falconer I think it was the falconer so yeah yeah okay falconer sure yeah not like I just reread it <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they're one in the same same purpose yeah. <laughs> well. <laughs> And and we think Locke is under the spell. We think he's about to go kill Jean. And then he turns and you're right, it is a falconer because then he attacks the falcon too. And uh, and we find out, and he's like, it's what makes you think that that's my real name? I love that reveal. That was so good. So powerful. Yeah, that one, like I noticed this time the language that was used and I thought it was really clever because... Um, Obviously, you are meant to think that Locke is under the spell, and I still think he does a good job of that, but I noticed that there wasn't actually any language used about Locke feeling, like, compelled. There was only language about what he was physically doing in terms yes. of, like, picking up a hatchet or, like, whatever. And then when he turns, you're like, oh, okay, like, you know, he was doing this all along. Yes, and you're so caught up in the scene that you don't notice until yeah. you're reflecting on it. It's like, ah. Uh, of course. <laughs> Definitely only noticed that the second time. Mm -hmm. but that's There's... the brilliance of that writing, right? I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Ben, sorry. It looks like you were going to say something. Uh, I was going to say as well, I like the, the, I think the reason that the uh, the, the name, like the, the, the idea of Locke not being, uh, like what gave you that idea? I just, I think that the fact that the Falconer is so perfectly set up to be so assumptive in his power and everything like makes that a believable uh like twist the the idea that he's like i i i have absolutely no credence to believe this but i'm so sure of myself that and i think that that makes a, a interesting parallel because i think i think the gray king and and the falconer are directly parallel to Locke in terms of how people view them and the kind of assumptive power they have over others um that i think that that like, that, that feels like um the reason that the Falcon has his downfall is that he's assuming power over someone who is also the same type of person. Um, and I think, I think that scene works really well for that. You just yeah. made me think of something. What? Which is that um, I think there's a really interesting contrast there where you were saying that like we believe it because the Falconer is so sure. And I think that there's a contrast between saying like, well, Lamora is obviously false, but Locke is true. I feel like we're more likely to believe somebody when they can say that they're sure they're wrong about something. We're more likely to be like, well, then you're probably right about the thing that you're mm -hmm. sure is right. I don't know if that makes sense. But when you said that, I was like, that's a really interesting parallel to um, the climax, or well, not the not the final climax, but the interactions in Raven's Reach after the the statues are like neutralized, is that Locke uses the fact that he just gave them like an insanely important truth to then deceive them again about the ships and like where the money is. And that's sort of like, maybe that's a little bit of a reach to like. No, no, that's a really good point. <laughs> yeah. But I was like, that's kind of what Scott Lynch is doing, or at least what Locke is doing to those people. Because yeah. now they believe what he says because he just like saved them.
Yeah, I love that. That's so true. And he does he does a good job too because when he first speaks, when he first is like, listen, break up on one of the statues, we're all done for if we believe this. And he essentially has to break through a spell she's under where she's forgotten that she didn't want to make this deal in the first place. And uh, and he convinces her to trust him, even though there's absolutely no way that she would have trusted him. So she goes, he goes from tie me up, put a gun to my back, like, or a knife, put like show that you don't trust me kill me in an instant just let me speak this out and he convinces them when they they shouldn't have trusted him but they finally do and their lives are saved by it and then they're lulled into this false sense of security only for him to backstab them again in a way so that he can get this offering and i that's like that's so lock that he couldn't <laughs> just leave it there <laughs> that's that's what i was gonna say it's just so fundamentally part of his character he could be <laughs> telling his best friends the truth but he's gotta have another just something playing against it. there's gotta be some <laughs> sleight of hand it. happening he yeah. can't help himself yeah. <laughs> he really can't ben that's exactly right he's he's compulsive he's compulsively clever so much so that it's his own demise sometimes but and that's how he gets us too, you know, as the reader, because you're just like, yeah, he's tricking them, but he's tricking me just as much. Going, yeah, oh yeah, he he would, he's telling the truth. He, why would he even come back to get himself back in jail and get you know put to death or whatever to to save all of you? And it's like, of course he's going to be right about everything else. He, yeah. And then you're like, oh my gosh, Lynch has been telling me this whole time that's not even who he is. Why mm -hmm. would I think that again? Like, yeah. why would he trick me again? Yeah. <laughs> And along with that, he's so clever in that when he has these, he has plans like uh, the Cup of Barsavi where he walks up to him, tells him the whole plan so that he can swindle him some more. Like he's so clever in that way. But then when things start to go wrong, when a new element is introduced, when the Grey King is introduced, and he's like, okay, I got to be Lucas Fairway in this context, but also the Grey King knows who I am. So, okay, but I have to pretend to be the Grey King. So I need to get violently ill. Like he's so good at pivoting in these impossible situations and there was a scene where when the when the, everybody wanted to bail and he was like he was like this is what chains trained us for when our backs against the wall when there's no way out we figure it out and i'm like fuck and i think chains i think chains try to keep you alive because you're an idiot yeah. <laughs> i don't think he wanted you to keep pushing i think there was a lot of context to what chains was saying <laughs> Yeah, I think he more meant like not in a situation that you yourself created and thrown <laughs> yeah. back against the wall. <laughs> and when there is a way out, you can run. You're choosing to <laughs> dig deeper. <laughs> when I and put myself against the wall, when the wall is a door, then, <laughs> then we keep going forward. That's the metaphor. That's the one. <laughs> That's so true. And speaking of chains. He is, it's so hard for me to figure out how to articulate my love for him because it's like, you're not a good guy. Like you're, <laughs> you're buying orphans, teaching them to swindle and thieve. You know, you're it, like, this isn't a good situation, but he's such a good mentor to them. Like he really tries to teach them character in the midst of this difficult world and dark world that they have to learn to survive in. And they have to be really smart in order to do so. And like he's not teaching them to be good guys in a bad world, but he is teaching them to be loyal and he's teaching them to be smart. He's teaching them that if you don't know everything about a situation that you could know, then shut your effing mouth and be polite. <laughs> you know, like it's also probably like it's it's objectively probably like the best education that any kids in the city that aren't like noble born are getting <laughs> right <laughs> it really is the language and the table skills and like all of the different <laughs> things that they're learning about so that they can be chameleons they're really educated and they're actually learning to be decent people who screw people over <laughs> well it, and it goes like i think a big theme is just who who are really the bad guys who are really the good guys right in daily life even okay. just uh who who is that right and i think yeah. we make judgment calls very easily in our lives and it's especially in my line of work i'm like you know there's there's a lot Bryce of Bryce is a lawyer there <laughs> that, that you there you know and again the, the lawyers are the 
you, those are the easy bad people. So, but the, 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 the good people that you see, like people are struggling out there and you have no idea, but I, I do love that concept of just, you know, who really is the bad guys? I'm like, is it the people that are just trying to keep, I don't know, all the, the poor people down and just keep themselves in riches, right? And then, you know, is Robin Hooding them? a bad thing and, and again it just i'm not trying to answer any of these questions i'm just saying i love that he's got you thinking about it and going wait a sec because this I, I feel like was at the really uh you know there became this like big huge change from fantasy where it's like you know who the good guy is you know who the bad guy is and then it was like and it maybe it's just how i read a song of ice and fire going into this and going oh wait who the good guy is like i just went from hating a guy who pushed a, a kid off of a freaking tower and then now he's my favorite character somehow I'm like, <laughs> i don't even know how that worked out and you know and so, and so just i love that idea and then not to mention just this whole idea that chains has a, i love this like fake it till you make it you know if you know enough to, to get by you can you can get a long way and people will just assume it that you know what you're doing <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of times Grimdark can feel like, here's a dark world, and here's your edgy characters. And this feels like, here's a dark world, and this is the way you survive in it. Like, this is this is just what you do. And good versus bad usually isn't so clear cut. And it's usually a lot of different levels of, okay, in this situation, how, what are you, what can you do? It's not as, it's not like, do you steal the bread or do you let your family starve? You know, it's not usually a yes or no <laughs> kind of answer. It's I also really, think, oh, sorry, Ben, go. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, um, I also enjoy, uh, I've completely forgotten. Um, so I'm going to let you go. <laughs> okay, well, you think about that. Yeah, um, yeah. No, I was going to say, it's just a really interesting wrinkle because um, like just talking about good versus bad and how like blurry it can be. Obviously, the gentleman bastards like, they are kind of stealing for their own gain. I mean, at the very least, they're maintaining their own like lifestyle and their their wardrobe and whatever for the stuff they can do. But they're not like they're certainly not Robin Hooding it by like giving the money to the poor or anything. But at the same time as that, they um, partially, I'm sure, because of Locke's ambition, have chosen to steal from like potentially the only people that actually deserve like stealing from in this world. Because with the secret peace and with everything, like obviously the nobility are trying to protect themselves, but they essentially created this purse, this um, this system where they're like the only people you can steal from are the poor. <laughs> like so even though I'm sure that it's because the gentleman bastards want to like go big or go home is probably why they're doing this. They're still at least like they're not stealing from the poor. I don't know. It's a really weird combination of factors that you're like, well, they're still not necessarily good or bad. It's just complicated. It's just complicated. And there is some nobility in creating a brothership and having a family that you would live and die for and it's not like they're actively going out and you know killing people for their own gain like you know the gray king or the falconer might be doing granted there are instances where they do steal from those who are not wealthy like when they had to go steal a body <laughs> and they, they couldn't make one uh, they couldn't like kill somebody they had to get come by it honestly and so what they do is just cry in the street until people hand them money <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was a lot more to that, you know, they they played a, a whole bit, but I, that scene was so brilliant to me because Locke's just like, oh, you need more money? Here, bribe you more? Sure, of course. And then one of the twins steals what's left. <laughs> and he's like, oh no, I'm ruined. <laughs> so people just hand them money. <laughs> it's so brilliant. Even Chains is like, huh, I guess that's a way to do that. <laughs> Look, I didn't even think about it. Yeah, like his reaction to everything Locke does. He's like, well, <laughs> "Poor chains." You did achieve what I set out for you, but also, like, huh, that really isn't yeah. going to do it. He's it? just trying to make an honest thief out of him, and he's so theatrical. <laughs> <laughs> ben, did you have something you were fixing to say? I remember. I remember. I do it. Uh, I was going to say the fact that uh, I really enjoy that everyone's hiding behind someone in this book. Like when we were talking about the idea of uh, like the power structure and everything, 
I like the idea that you, you like you have the thief maker, and then you find out about chains, and then you find out about the kappa, and then like even the Grey King has is basically hiding behind the falconer. And I like that, uh, like Bug and the other gentleman bastards are kind of hiding behind Locke. And I, I do like the fact that no matter whose side everyone on, everyone's hiding behind someone else because someone else is more powerful somewhere. And so, uh, like, and the idea of like even the rich people are having to rely on the um, what are they called the midnighters, and it's like they can't even defend themselves. They're like, well, these people are more powerful physically, so I need them. And it's like everyone is is reliant on someone more powerful in a different way than them. And I think that's I really love that as well. What's that? Like What's Locke that? Um, hiding behind Jean as well in a way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who's Jean like hiding behind? His hatches, oh, the sisters. I was gonna say the oh, wicked sisters. <laughs> Jean doesn't need to hide. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no, that's so true. I like uh, that's a really good observation, and I'm even thinking of um, in the situation with uh, when Locke is being Lucas Fairwhite and um, the Kappa Barsavi. <laughs> He's like, "Congratulations, you get to date my daughter." <laughs> 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 it's just like. Thank you. <laughs> Him and Nazca just look at each other like, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> How do we figure this out? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, the so another thing too is magic in this world. There's We've talked about how they're not magic users, but there's a lot of really interesting uses of magic, not just with the, the hand and the name written on the hand, but we have the po the potions that Locke had to drink to get violently ill and then recover, but it to Jean's eyes, it seemed to age him 20 years because uh, it taxed him so much. There was a needle that he got stabbed with that was like, okay, you're poisoned. <laughs> Tell me something, <laughs> you know, like there's there's so many really interesting uses of magic um, and interesting ways of getting around it. Like you can't kill a bonds mage. If you do, you just, it's just going to go real bad for you. So what do we do? We cut out his tongue. We break all his fingers. Now no more magic. Like, you know, like there's <laughs> interesting ways around it all. And I think he does a really good job of slowly showing, like slowly expanding what that all means and making the world feel organically so much bigger that way. One of the things that I thought was just so impressive just along that lines is just from the moment you meet Locke, you not only get his characterization as he thieves constantly, like that's all he does, but you immediately get introduced to the piece, right? <laughs> like mm -hmm. by just that, that, so like it's already setting the whole stage and there's just so many things just as you, you're talking here, but all of you guys are talking, I'm like, there's so many things that just yeah. set up so well to connect in the end. Uh, it's like it's just so brilliant I, I just then I go like and then I sound dumb because I can't talk about it no right no I know so Ben you mentioned before that you had wrong expectations going into it with Locke's brilliance being uh being put a spotlight on so much by people and I think I'm super guilty of that and just I have dedicated reviews for these books and I love talking about them extensively because I honestly think that these books do near everything brilliantly. But when you just give a quick pitch for The Lies of Locke Lamora, it's tremendously difficult to do because these books are so layered and they're so complicated and they do so much that it's like, how do I give you a quick pitch other than Oliver Twist plus... Ocean's Eleven. Like, how do you actually right. really yeah. give this book a pitch that does it any sort of justice? Yeah, exactly. Because you can't really, like, capture it in so few words. You kind of have to experience it and figure out. And you don't want to be spoiling it either to try and, like, explain more of the things that it does. Mm -hmm. You have to somehow make someone really want to read it without, like, telling them the good parts because you don't want to spoil them. <laughs> yeah. I feel like in order to properly pitch this book, I need 10 minutes. Like I need to dig into the writing styles, the humor, the structure, the the relationships between the characters, how incredibly complicated this system is and how complicated it is to work within it and to do what Locke and Jean and the Gentleman Bastards have to do. It's like, it's so hard to just be like, Here's your pitch. <laughs> and and it doesn't always work well too, because one of my favorite parts is just feeling a part of this brotherhood. Like you yeah. feel like you're right in the middle of it and you're like, no, that's you're not right. very exciting. Um, but, but I love that. Like you feel like they're so well characterized 
down, you know, even the comic relief, like twins, I feel like, or even just the fact that, I mean, they totally act like twins. I have twin daughters that like love, like trying to trick you as to who, who is it? They're identical. <laughs> yeah. and, like, you know, and just, it's anyway, that's, that's what the, that's the, the character is. So you, you have a Caldo and a Caldo in yes, your home. Exactly, right? Today I'm Caldo. Let me name them. Right? So annoying. That's so rude. <laughs> You might need to worry about them though if they're like Helen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, for sure. <laughs> they're clever though, so I mean, hey. Um, another thing that I think um, the series does really well is it really, really hits those emotional punches, like in the small ways, like with Jean's first introduction. And Locke doesn't like him because he's fat. And really, it's because he's a new kid and Locke's a new kid. And he doesn't want another new kid in the fold. But, like, he picks on his weight and he picks on his, you know, that he's soft and he's crying. And uh, Chains, lovely man, when, when Locke's like, well, he's fat. And Chains is like, so am I. And you're ugly. What of it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, you... you you see, you find out that he just lost his family five days ago and he's really hurting, but he's also incredibly strong and he's incredibly smart, good with numbers. And, you know, you have these little things where it's like, oh, okay, instantly I care about this guy. But then you also have the big things like the climax, I would call it, when we lose the twins and we lose Bug. And it's genuinely devastating. I don't know. Did any of you see that? Like, did you think we were going to lose so much of our crew? No, definitely not. And then yeah, this no, time, knowing what was going to happen, I just felt like the dread creeping up on me for so long before it happening. Like, obviously, the surprise impact wasn't there, but the, like, dr sinking of your stomach and, like, just the terrible feeling of what was happening, that still definitely existed yeah yeah no i same on reread every time it's like here it comes as soon as Locke realizes oh we got to go get to the twins we got to go make sure they're okay i know what's coming and it uh, sucks it happened way earlier than i remembered it happening so it's still <laughs> it's by surprise i was like well this is deep in the third act oh it's happened it, we're too there's so through. much left so like, yeah even then i was still taken aback it's the same as the uh Barsavi's daughter as well like that took that still took me by surprise this time that's the one that happened way earlier than i remember yeah mm -hmm. because i remembered when the other deaths happened in terms of like the events leading up to that so i was kind of like oh i'm dreading this because i can tell that we've set the wheels in motion but nazca i did not like i was like oh They've had like two conversations. We get that they're friends and then she's gone already. Like, yeah. But it was yeah. enough still that it was a gut punch. Yeah. You're like, that's the yeah. thing was, I, I don't know how he did it so quickly that I already, I was like, I'm getting to like her. And I was like, oh gosh. I agree. It really felt like she was a well fleshed out character yeah. that had a future ahead of her. Like she wasn't just somebody that was there to kill off. She, she really felt like she held weight in the story before we lost her. And then bringing that full circle where uh, Locke is pretending to be the Grey King and then he's getting stuck in the vat to drown there as well is it was it was so it was just such good storytelling yeah and I think the flashback carries like some of the heavy lifting on that one because when we see Nazca and Locke as children I mm. feel like that goes a long way uh, yes to the emotional like getting her to like kind of settle into like, you feel like she's been there the whole time because she yeah. has, even though in the present day, we haven't had that much time with her. Mm -hmm. When I think, I mean, Lynch really went all out in this one. And I think maybe that, and again, I haven't read the other two that are out, but I just feel like that maybe kind of goes into why people don't consider the other two as good as this first one, because he really went all out. Like if you're willing to like, I mean, he killed off the, like, what is it? <laughs> what, what five six, six, six of the team <laughs> yeah exactly like yeah. a huge amount of the whole team and you're loving them you're feeling part of them and that's why you're just like gut punched crying when you like no matter how many times you read it i assume i've only done it once rewrite it once but it's i'd like, like it to be said only half of the team died just okay. because tabitha is absent does not mean oh, that point. she's not a gentleman bastard cool. are y'all excited to meet her so I was gonna yeah. say, I, I was gonna say that it's like 
I think that's another thing I admire about the book is the fact that it's it's not afraid to constantly set up that character and then be like, and then then not pay off. Did you expect to meet them? Like, I know. Well, 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 foreshadowed. This is there's more than one book. This is foreshadowing the whole book. Yeah. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Like, I was, I, I was not anticipating it uh, mm-hmm. that, that first time. Where it's like, it's kind of a, it's a cool, it's a really cool thing to do. Is just it to is completely set up a character and be like, well, there's a reason to come back. You, you need to find out. And I'm like, yeah, you, you're right. I really do. Well, I, I think you really. really oh, you really have to know your characters to be able to do that. And not to mention, you really need to know your characters to be able to do the flashbacks the way he's done it here, because he had to know them in and out to be able to go back and keep coming to the forward and still have the, the present still match up on the previous present times. Yeah. That's partially why I don't mind that these books take so long for Lynch to write Because, well, I mean, I know he has a lot going on in his personal life, and that should always take priority. But also, these books, it's they're written so intentionally, as you said, Bryce, where it's like, you got to know your story, your characters, where they're going. You need to know this stuff inside and out to make something as complicated as this to actually flow together and work. And put on top of that, the humor, put on top of that, the prose, put on top of that, the world, and even stuff like the mages being foreshadowed and the information that you get there and, and like things that are being introduced in this book that don't get paid off until later. This is all skill. Like this is some serious skill to pull this kind of thing off. And a lot of people would say it wasn't pulled off. I would say that it was. <laughs> I would say they're crazy. <laughs> Bryce, for what it's worth, I love the second book just as much. Oh, good. Me too. Good. I like uh, the second book even more so than the excited. first one. Yeah, oh, I was like, after I finished the second one, um, it's been a while now, but I was debating on like, maybe I actually do like it more. They're both. It's my they're favorite just- cover. I love that cover. I'm just sucking for ships. <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> I, I was going to say one thing about Sabbath. The one thing I also like is that Lynch often laughs at his audience. So, like with the Sabbath thing, I like the idea that in every conversation, they're like, oh, really sorry, bud. And he's like, oh, I guess everyone knows about this. And we're all sat there like, I don't. I'm the <laughs> who wants to know. And I hey. like that he's almost laughing every time he brings it up. It's like, oh, everyone knows about this. I'm like, I swear, you need to start giving information. <laughs> that is funny. No, <laughs> he's like yes. it's a joke, his personal joke on us as the reader. That's I love that. That's so brilliant. You're right. That's yeah. That's so well put. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. Where Lynch is like, I've got information, and everybody knows it but you. <laughs> and it's like it really is treated like Chekhov's gun, where it's like, all right, she's being mentioned. It's being foreshadowed. Locke cannot get past her. She's at even to his dying breath when he's like, Locke or Jean, you have to leave me if you see Sabatha again. And Jean's like, no, <laughs> get up, <laughs> right? And um, I love that it's like, okay, this has to pay off, but Lynch will do it when he does it, <laughs> which one makes the world that... feel more living too. Sorry, Grace, go. Sorry. I was going to say one thing that was genuinely funny to me in a sea of like kind of sadness at the end of the book was when like they're having that conversation and Locke's like, you need to leave me. I, I'm like finding it genuinely funny that I'm like, Jean is your like strong friend. Like he would never. He's going to carry you. Like it's I'm not like way. Jean's lying on the floor dying and Locke's like, well, what am I going to do about this? Yeah. I'm like, Locke, you're a small man. <laughs> like, yeah, it's just, but he's such a drama queen. In like, his defense, <laughs> Jean's beaten up. Like, Jean was about to die two seconds ago. So I feel like <laughs> Locke not thinking, like him just thinking, get out of here. Don't risk your life for me again. I do think Jean on the verge of death is still stronger than me, to be yeah. fair. <laughs> I think he can crawl, like, he can put yeah. this little little man under his arm and easily carry someone else with like him as well. He's a dog or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's missing a leg and eyeball is just dangling out of his pocket and he's still like with his stump of an arm he's still carrying him out. <laughs> That's we'll do that for luck, He would. I also find it funny that just a few chapters ago Jean or maybe the previous um Jean was like you got to leave me because my true name is out there and you're vulnerable like I would have killed you. 
if if this mistake hadn't been made, if the falconer hadn't turned his attention to you, I would have killed you. So I'm a liability. You have to go. And Locke's like, you idiot. I'm nothing without you. And then the tables turn so quickly where, where Locke's like, you just got to go. You just got to get out of here. And Sean's like, what? No. no. <laughs> Obviously, that's not what's happening today. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like yeah. a lot of those. There's a lot of those kind of themes, too, in here where it's just like, it's known, right? And it's like that loyalty, <clears throat> excuse me, is known. And I felt like even like the, the mages, right, were like that guild. It's just known you don't mess with them. And if you yeah. do, and so you just get that into your head where it's like, it's just known. And then Lynch is like, ha ha, <laughs> I'm going to screw with this. And I'm mm -hmm. going to kill off half of your people <laughs> in your, you know, in your group that you love. And yeah. we're going to go after the mages and let them actually like experience that. Like maybe they don't own everything and aren't able to just get away with anything they want. Yeah. Yeah. I think... I was expecting, because the world is so dark, I was expecting to lose a gentleman bastard. You just don't expect to lose so many. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So we're coming up. We're getting close to an hour. Is there, um, I would like to end on, since we, we're gushing, which we should, I would like to end on um, everybody offering up one, maybe if, if, if it were me, what I would change. And then your favorite scene or a favorite scene okay go that ben. Is quite the daunting thing to put on it it uh, is i would go that my favorite i'll go favorite scene first because i think that's easier uh i genuinely think that scene with the um the, the first conversation with the falconer when he says nice bird i think that's a great scene like that whole interaction is fantastic yeah um and I think if I was gonna if I was gonna change something, I would maybe uh, cut. A, well, it's funny. I, I would cut a little fat and then add more. I'd, I'd stack. Ooh, that, 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 interesting. I I I I do agree with you. I think that little bit where <clears throat> it does slow down could have used maybe like just a little bit of tightening. Yeah. But I also would read a five hundred page book of uh, lock in. Uh, with the thief maker and going with chains i would oh, read yeah. infinitely more of that i think the whole oliver twist thing i adore that section yes. and I, I really love the thief maker as well and so i, I think uh, as much as it's a negative i'm like i also would just like more please hey that's a it's great funny. that's a great negative and it's also funny considering oliver twist you know yes. please i have some more <laughs> Can I have some more please <laughs> yes no i agree there's so much gold that comes from that part like when uh this is again focusing on chains but when chains is is telling him these are when he tells him to make a death offering for the boy or for the kids that died because of him and he's like they're, they weren't my friends i don't care about them he's like oh they're your best friends because they're going to teach you something if you're going to kill in self-defense if you're going to kill because you have to fine but if you're if people are dying because of negligence, that's on you. Those lives are on you and you're going to learn from this. Like that kind of teaching moment that comes from that whole section is so valuable to the story. Grace, give me your negative. Give me I'm your- I'm literally sitting here like I can't think of one. And I know that sounds stupid, but like, it's not that it's, it's not that it's perfect because like I don't think any book can be that. But no, it's just, you can call it perfect. When I think about <laughs> when I think about it, I'm like, well, I don't know that there's anything that I would actually change because I think that when I read this and I think about what he's going for, I feel like he achieved exactly what he was going for and I loved it. Yeah. Maybe I would see, this is the tough part because I love the flashbacks. Like I love the stuff with chains and I love like the gentleman bastards meeting each other and like seeing them form those relationships. So I almost would say I want more of that, but then I don't know that the book would actually benefit from that. Like, I don't think it would make the book better. I would just take, like, maybe a short story collection of that. Um, but then, like, favorite scene. Um, I don't know. It's there's, – there's a lot. But I think I might give a shout-out to um, Jean against the Berengia sisters. Oh, he, yeah. That's really his moment to shine in this book. Yeah. Like, Locke gets to do so much shining throughout mm -hmm. the whole book. And obviously, like, Jean doesn't 
um, get like pushed to the side or anything because you very much see their relationship. But that was, I think, when we finally got to see him, like we're building up seeing him being taught to fight in the flashbacks throughout the book. And then we kind of really get to see him like in action doing something that is insanely important because if those two aren't out of the way, then everything goes differently and very poorly for them. And um, I was just kind of, I was proud of him and they're both kind of doing their parts, but their strengths are different. Yeah. I love yeah. that. That's so true. That kind of goes under the radar for me because I'm so on the hook in that moment that I don't stop to just notice this is his time. This is his time to shine. Yeah. I only noticed it this time. I don't think I really noticed it on the first time, but I was reading that being like, well, Locke is kind of out of the game right now. And so this is Jean's turn to like do his part. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Bryce, do you have your answer? I think so. Um, Cause it's a hard one. And I've been gushing like crazy this whole time. Um, Cause it is, it was like an easy five star, right? <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, Oh, is it five? You know, it could be close, but this was like, not even, I mean, it's, it could be read as a standalone. It's, I mean, it just, it has so much going for it. Um, I, for thing to fix, maybe if I, again, gun to my head here, um, maybe just like more about like what the the magic could do, right? Like more, it was because it was kind of like a lot of just like, then they destroyed the whole town and everything, right? And it was just like, yeah. you know, more into the like details. I like the details. Maybe I've read You like your heart and, magic system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so maybe if, again, I'm, I'm like really have to, you know, I love to know the details of it, which again, you're not always going to get, and I don't... So I, you want to follow a Bonds mage. You want to kick lock to the curb, <laughs> and you want to follow the Falconer. I know, right? I, I want to flashback on the Falconer, okay? How did he grow up? <laughs> More pages, mean? please. That's what we want. In the Falconer, the Falcon itself. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, oh, gosh, as far as a favorite, probably other than what Ben mentioned, because that scene is just so, it's like you feel like Yes, because you're just <laughs> introduced to how much you do not mess with Bond's mage, and he's just like middle finger right to them, <laughs> like, and you're just like, that is awesome, and that takes some guts to yeah, say the least. Really, oh, it's no, or idiocy. And, yeah, yeah, ex which again is just that's luck, right? That's and luck. <laughs> and but I don't know, just other than that, I I mean, just the 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 times that the you know, that, that he or um, he and the rest of the team are just like, you know, well, I, and I can't even quote exactly. I can look it up. But when they're like, you liar. And, well, you know, well, I, I'm just oh, doing this yeah. to be my family. You liar. I'm just, you know. Just doing like, it because I love it. You bastard. <laughs> you, exactly. Like just that camaraderie throughout. And that's yeah. like obviously a, a cop out. But it's, I just love, like, that's part of what I love the most about this is just that team. Yeah, yeah, it is. I agree. The The relationships in this book. I, I've had so many people come back to me and be like, you overhype the friendships. And I'm like, fair enough. It just speaks to me. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. their, their camaraderie just speaks to me. I eat it up. I would take 100 more pages of just them living life together, doing yeah. odd jobs together. We just need more pages. That's what I'm taking away from this. <laughs> um, okay, so favorite scene for me. Easily lock wrapping the cloth around the what was it the the second crowns oh the, yeah 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 the rival gang in one of the flashbacks uh, oh, where yeah and and he so he good. gets him alone and he has this piece of cloth that Jean sewed into his clothes and he wraps it around him and he gets him all tied up and he's getting pummeled he's getting beaten bloody. And the guy's like, what are you doing? I'm I'm going to kill you. Like, this is so easy for me. You've tied yourself to me. You can't get away. You can't fight back. And he's like, I don't need to fight back. I don't need to get away. I just need to wait for Sean. And he's like laughing. He's cackling. He's insane. <laughs> and then and then the guy's like, let go of me. Let go. And Sean's figure is coming. It's like, oh. I, every time I read this scene, I weep. Like, it's pitiful. It's not a hype scene for me. It's like, it's like, they love each other so much. <laughs> it's so good. And my one, um, my, it's not even, it's not even a negative necessarily. 
And it's, so I'll, I'll put it this way. This is the end of the video. We're going to say bye after this. Um, so if anyone wants to click off, that's okay. No spoilers, but slight implications for book two. So Grace, I'm talking to you. Um, I would have loved if Lynch had only killed Bug or only killed Bug and one of the twins, as much as it hurts me to say that, and carried somebody over into the next book so that we could show, hey, this there like there's weight here. We're doing something. Nobody's safe. But then a sacrifice that happens in book two could be swapped for continuing to pick off our gentleman bastards and then also maybe adding new gentlemen bastards to show that if we take someone away, we can still add more. The group, the crew can ever change. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Did that make sense? Do you know, do you know what I'm talking about, Grace? No, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's just, it's more of a critique for book two. There's a, there's a sacrifice made in book two that I'm like, ah, I wish we could have just added instead of subtracted. Um, but that's, that's all I'll say about that. It's totally like, like the like the Weasley twins, just just one. Yeah. Right. No, I don't like that. I don't like killing one twin. I, I want to keep them together. Well, I was actually thinking that I wish we could have saved Bug because, like, when they get to the temple, the twins are already dead, and I know that sounds really cruel to say, but Bug thinking like that he can challenge this man and then just getting shot is so heartbreaking and i get that that scene is there because we like he wants the impact of actually seeing one of them die rather than just finding them like that i think but part of me is like well i mean kayla and galdo were already dead like bug was still like there could we have saved bug could he not have sacrificed himself like that but yeah See, I'm more attached to the twins than I am Bug. So for for me, no, I I am too. But I was just thinking, like Bug was still alive with them. Yeah, and he had a chance. Fair and, enough. But I mean, this, the if you think how I just keep thinking back to like when he he gets there to their you know place and and both the twins are dead. I just remember just how much of an impact that had. So I get why he did that because it was. Like, I don't know if anything else in the book had more of an impact than that moment exactly. for me, at least. Yeah. But it was yeah. rough. I hate it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I hate it, too. It's good. Thanks, it's I good it. writing. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. I hate it. It's great. <laughs> it just hurts. <laughs> Is there anything else y'all want to touch on before we say goodbye? I could keep talking for another hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just going to say no. <laughs> I know. We've been talking for an hour, and it's and it's like there's still so much to talk about in this book. When are we doing so Red rich. Seas? Honestly, I, though, I, I, I will. Do I'm it. reading Red Seas in, uh, in October. It's already October. I'm reading Red Seas at the end of this month. So if y'all want to read it, too, we can keep talking. I am in. Yay! I might not <laughs> no pressure, but it if you do. This month, but I could probably read it like late October into November. All right, cool. Well, I mean, no pressure, but hit me up if you do end up reading it and we will keep talking. Absolutely. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining me for this chat. Again, everybody's channel is linked in the description. So please check everyone out, all amazing channels. Um, and we will see you next time. Bye. <laughs>